Well, people, I stand before you again, thankful for a good vacation, but I do desire to be before you to bring to you the word of God, to guide you in his truth, and to see these faces looking at me with joy on some of them, and some kind of still and placid, but again, it's your face, our brethren. Now, I decided as we come, since we've been a month away from the book of Colossians, that I would do a little overview going back on what we've seen, because I believe there's many things that the Paul has taught us, many things that we've gone over that is almost like now bending the nail over, making it tight so it will be that which will be in our hearts and we will not lose them. So I want to do a review. And I got this great idea that I'm going to review all three of the beginning chapters. Now, that may be my desire, but I don't know if I'll make it through. We leave that to the Lord. So if I don't, we can finish the review next Lord's Day. But I hope what I have here in my mind, I hope to have you to understand the importance of the, the scriptures. We know there's an importance of Paul's writings and all his books and all that God gives us in the word of God, there is an importance of it. But Paul is getting together, he gives some great teaching in the book of Colossians. He's speaking to a church which has come to birth and it's not by his ministry, but now he's heard word from them and he is now giving them great directions. And, and we must understand, and I know you do, that God's word was not just given at the time that he gave it to Paul. God's word is given just as alive right now as if we were sitting back there in the church of Colossae and when someone wrote, read the letter that was received from Paul. It is just as powerful and just as fresh to us today because it is God's word. God is speaking to us in this word. It means the same thing to us as it did for the brethren that Paul was writing to. We read the Bible and are pleased with the truth and the doctrine that we see in the Bible. Whatever it presents, we are glad to hear that. But how often do we apply with the word that we read? How often do we take it and put it to work in us daily? That as we leave this place from worshiping God and receiving his word, and even in your own private reading, having that word going with you throughout the day, throughout the week, and piling up on what you've already read, building you up in the holy face. Paul does a wonderful job in this very epistle here that we've looked through as he brings truth upon truth and showing us how important it is. And brethren, you and I cannot be those who just come to the scriptures and say, it is very important, you know, the spiritual lessons laid out here and all that we've covered, it is very important. I read it and I know and I understand it, but I don't look back at it again. Or I don't have it applied to my heart that I'm living and working out the truth which God has given to us. I want you to answer this question in your hearts before we begin. Have I seriously applied the truth of this book to my heart and life? Think about that for a moment. We've gone through Colossians almost all three chapters, the beginning chapters, have I really applied it to my life? If you cannot give a positive answer, please do so as we take this review stroll over the book of Colossians and have the Lord once again to bring everything to us. Now, there's no way I'm not going to dive deeply into each thing that we looked at and what we are. I want again, it's an overview. But I'm praying with the help of the Holy Spirit that Paul would show us and God would show us all that we need as men and women today as we worship the living God. Now, as you look at it, Paul begins in Colossians 1. He thanks God for the salvation of the brethren in the church which he heard of. We find that in verses 1 down to verse 7. Paul says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brethren, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to you. 
Paul is saying that it was God himself who enabled them to live a life worthy of his name. It was God who was the one who caused him. And Paul is certain of this because of the letter or the word he got from Epaphras of the church itself. Probably went on to the birth of the church, the preaching of the church, and what has taken place. And how the brethren are even walking at this particular time. Paul was pleased for what he received. Paul said the church was going on. And he, from what was given to him, he saw that the church were bearing fruit of good works. And Paul knew that that was not something that is done by man alone. The only one that could be done is by the Spirit of God himself. He said they were increasing in the knowledge of God. And that is because the truth had come to them. We open our Bibles, we read them, it tells us of God. But how much do we increase in his knowledge? Isn't it a wonderful thing? We read the scriptures in the morning when we come here. We read some, some parts of the Old Testament, which we probably have read many times before. How many times can we have heard when we heard the scriptures read this morning, give glory, give thanks to God. A refrain over and over again. Why not give glory and thanks to him because who he is? It also shows us that this word, they were strengthened with power for the accomplishment and the steadfastness of patience. They were those who were walking. They were walking in a strong, straight line for God. They had patience in their heart because they know God was working in them and God is going to do what needed to be done. Joyously, Paul says, giving thanks to God the Father who gave us a blessing of the inheritance Paul can say all that they had, it all came from Christ. These graces have been imparted by us, to us rather, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on in that first section, he said, he rescued us from death. Just stop for a moment. Think about that. From death. You are not going to die. Now, does that mean physical death? No, that means eternal. You will live forever. And he said that he understood that he saw what God has done. But Paul didn't say, not only did he rescue us from his, by his death, but he also translated us into his kingdom. Not we will be translated. He has translated us right now into his kingdom. Men and women walk on the face of the earth. They tell you about different religions and what religions they do. A crowd of people come around, man-made religion. They hope and they pray that this or that will be done. They put up a standards of what they believe and how they will worship God. But most of them, they're so far off the truth. They don't know nothing of a salvation that God gives. The true and living God and that salvation. And he says here, we are right now in the kingdom of God. He gave us redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Oh, dear people, that's a wonderful thing to know. What man has lived upon the face of the earth who has not sinned? What woman, what boy or girl has not sinned? And to know that one day those sins will not come back to bite at us, not come back to say, thou art the man. No, they're gone. He translated, he forgave us from it. But how was that done? Paul goes on and he says in the first part, he thanks God for what Epaphras has given him and showing them what he has done, what God himself has done. And Paul goes on and he mentions how the Lord has described such a his wonderful way by the apostle Paul. It is Paul who says that now what has taken place, these have been truly strengthened in God. Notice if you look at verse nine and down a bit, just to pull some of it up, back into our minds. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, Paul, after he talking about the church, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with all the knowledge of God. He's saying here, God has done a wonderful work and that wonderful work which is done, we can see it, we can understand it. 
He then mighty works, verse 10, he said, so that you will walk in the manner worthy of the Lord. Paul is saying that you're not a people trying to do something and trying to be right. He said, you are, and I am convinced of this because of the report who has come to me. Verse 11, he says, you've been strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Paul is saying, it is not some kind of self-made religion. It is not some kind of body of truth that man has given to you and you're now trying to walk in it. No, God is working in you. That's what's make the difference. Paul has said, this is a grand thing that the Lord God has, himself has done. But Paul says, all this has been done by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Paul's description of Jesus Christ is given to us in verses 15 down to the verse 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul lets us know this God himself is the very one. Jesus Christ, we read of them in the book of Mark this morning. People coming to him, asking him questions. Do they know that he was the true image of God himself? God in the flesh, talking to these people at this time. And Jesus knows what he's going to do. And already he's beginning to straighten them out. We read here, he under, give them understanding in the Old Testament law and what needs to be done. But here Paul said, this is who he is. As we see him now, he is God himself. And he calls him the firstborn of all creation. Before anything was created, Paul is saying the truth of Christ and who he was was already in the heart and mind of God the Father. We know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Son was always the Son. The Son would be the one who would come into the world and die for his people. The created and said for him, not only that, he's the one who would die. All things were created in heaven and on earth, invisible things, thrones, dominions, rulers, authority, all was created by him and for him. And Paul goes on in this section here and he says what he does, Christ holds all things together. It's all in his power all in his hand. He is the only one that is keeping things going on this day. Take the very largest thing if we want to back up and see the entire universe. The sun is in the sky. The earth is here and the earth rotates. And basically what happens through the rotation of the earth, we receive what the earth needs in order for it to continue on its course. We go from season to season because Christ Jesus is holding it together. He's the one who's doing everything. And he says not only the invisible things, the visible things rather, also the invisible things. We cannot see in heaven and all the spiritual things that take place. But Paul is saying he's holding those things together also. God, Christ Jesus is the one keeping everything in possible and complete order. Then he says thrones, dominions, and authorities. Mankind believe that since he is the one who's on the earth and he is above every other thing created on the earth, he has to rule. He knows everything. He's going to do this, do that. Governments move, man's mind begin to go more and more and more. And I'm absolutely astonished at how much man can come up with. God said in the beginning, he made man in his image and after his likeness, he put him in a garden. He told him to be fruitful and multiply. And he said, now you have control over all things. And man is now giving so much out of the soil of this terrestrial ball here. He's bringing so much out of it. We now find out they're fighting what to do with AI. How are we going to have certain uh, Commuter, computers to now process everything. You can have a machine that can take your voice and speak for you, write papers for people in college and all like that. It's just coming out of man's head. 
But in a sense, two people, sin comes out of man's head also because it comes from his heart of wickedness and his sin. And he wants to do one thing, dethrone God and put himself on the throne and be the one who would do all things. So man is coming up with all this. But here Paul says he is the creator of all things and he has authority of all things. He holds all things in his hands. In a minute song, he got the whole world in his hands. You and me, brother, in his hands. Little bitty baby in his hands. He got the most powerful potentate on the face of the earth in his hands. And no one can do anything but what the Lord allows him to do. Oh, we shudder sometimes when we hear some guy uh, potentate over in, like in Russia, something, starting wars. What's going to happen? This is going to go into a nuclear war. What's going to take place? No, God has it in control. And if he lets it go that way, it's because that's what his plan is. And we can rest and say, no one can push away Christ in his hand upon him and say, I want to do what I want to do, forget God. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> man keeps saying there is no God and I don't follow God, but that doesn't change the fact. The fact is the Lord is the only one who's in control of all things. But Paul also says in this section here, he is the head over all things and he is the head of the church. Paul moves into a section here as he's now showing that, yes, God is all over all. Christ Jesus is over all. But what is he doing? He is in his church. Dear people, it's a sad thing when Christians kind of believe that Jesus Christ is kind of, he's not with me right now. He, he, he walked away. Or maybe in some cases, Christ, basically, he's so busy. Look at this world. Look at all the nations. If he got to tend to someone over there in Africa, how can he tend to me too? That shows that you don't have an understanding of who Christ is. He's everywhere at the same time. His fullness dwells among all people in a whole nation. That's what Paul is saying. All things have been reconciled through him, having made peace through his cross. Nothing is outside of the control of Christ. Oh, people say today, I got a religion, but I don't believe in Christ. Well, that religion ain't gonna do anything for you. If you have what man props up as religion, you have nothing. You remember, the, you notice for a fact, man, all over the face of the earth, they got religions. But what did it actually come from? Why do man have something in his heart that he has to have a God that he has to worship? Because he comes from that knowing <clears throat> that God made him, and so therefore he is not the one above all things. But he messes up. Cain and Abel, right from the beginning. Cain will not give to God what he required of him. So Cain figured he'll worship the way he want to worship. I'm not gonna give him the best. I'll give him this little part over here. I'll keep this for myself. That's what man been doing all the way down. I'll give God this little bit, you know? And every now and then, you say, well, I think I better pray, you know? You know some people that go through bad times, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, but you know what? That might work for me at this moment, I better pray. That's not gonna do it. Paul says he, that fullness of Christ dwells in him. The fullness of all God is and all he has made. He's reconciled all things to himself when he went to the cross. He made peace between man and God. <coughs> And that does not mean every single human being on the earth. That means now, out of mankind, God has made peace and he will have those who he bring to himself and they will become his. He has reconciled them to himself and they, from his reconciliation of his death upon the cross, they will not have to worry about anything. 
they will be found holy and blameless before God. Not later on, but right now. Oh, dear child of God, you who truly know the Lord Jesus Christ and saved by him, you don't have to wait one day to get that state of where you are so clear, close to Christ. You're already there. But Christ is even making us, God is making us more and more into the image of his son. But what he has now and who he is saved now, you are truly and completely saved. And Paul goes to all this in the first chapter. And what he does, he ends the chapter with, Paul speaks of his rejoicing and suffering for the church. We see that in verse 24 and down to the end of the chapter. Paul is saying, I rejoice, I'm suffering. I am a one who's put here by God to even be the minister to the church of God, and I'm going to suffer for it. At this time, Paul was in prison. But Paul is saying, I love the church, and I'm suffering for the church. And so he shows that. But then Paul goes on, and in chapter 2, we find Paul now looks, and he says that what the church need to understand, at this point, the church is built up in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying here, not only is the church his special economy, but the church is being built up. And we could take that two ways. It's being built up as far as more and more people being brought into the kingdom of God. And also, every little single church everywhere is being built up to be more and more like a body of Christ. And this is Paul saying, he shows us that this is the very thing we have to see and understand. Paul struggles for their growth in Christ. And he says that in the first five verses. Now in verse one, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and all those who have not not personally seeing my face. And he goes on, and what does he struggle? What does Paul want for them? He mentions those things. He suffered on their behalf. He labors earnestly for the growth of the church. Notice what he says in verse 3, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God God's mystery that is in Christ himself. Paul begins to move in this particular area is that the church is not looked at as a, a conglomeration of individuals untied to one another. No such thing in Paul's theology, no such thing in the Bible itself. What did God do in the beginning? He had a people for himself, the nation of Israel. He told Abraham, go out. I'm going to make you a people, not persons unconnected, a people united as one. And Paul says this is the very thing he sees and understands. He labors earnestly for the growth of the church. Not for single individuals. One of the things that is so bad in the Christian church today is that people think, I'm going to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all I'm concerned about is me growing. Be more and more like Christ. That is not in the scriptures. Our growing more and more in Christ pulls us, each and every one of us, together. We grow together. It's like one man said, you got to bunch of coals in a barbecue pit there. They're all bunched up together. And you see a red hot fire there. Take one of the little coals and push them off to the side. What happens to it? The flame goes out. Paul and the Bible does not have any such thing as salvation without being connected to the body of Christ. And this is what he says. And Paul shows, shows us this. You are built up in Christ, he says here. And he talks about who they are. He labors earnestly for the growth of the church, that they be connected in love. Some people have the idea, and I guess we all at one time had this idea when we were young Christians didn't know any better. We think, I go to church because I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And there is a lot of other people there. We call them church members, brothers and sisters, but I'm really not connected to them. When I leave the church, I've got a whole seven 
another six days in a week. I do whatever I want to do, and that's it. You know, on Sunday I go back to church again, and you know, and then at the afternoon I go back home. I'm in the world. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not it. He says that they are connected in love, full assurance of understanding, true knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says these particular things come because of who he is and what he is to us. He says, for even though I am absent from what? From you, brethren? In body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and stability of your faith in Christ. Paul says, this is the very thing that I, I yearn for. I suffer to see these things take place in you. Remember, Paul has not seen this people. He's only received word from them by his fellow ministry in the faith. Ministry in the faith. And Paul is saying, here's what I have for you. Though absent from them, he lets them know that he is with them in spirit, rejoicing in the discipline and the disability of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has said, a record has come to me. And oh, when your brother sent this letter to me, he told me all that was going on in the midst of the church. And he says, I know that can only be done by the work of God. But he goes on, he says, Paul exhorts them to continue in their godly life in Christ Jesus. And he says that quickly in verses six and seven, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now built, being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. He says, now this is what you do. Receive Christ. They received him, so walk in him. Do we know what that means? Walk in Christ. The only way we know is that is when we come to the scriptures themselves and our lives before Jesus Christ is laid out us to us in the word of God. How we must walk as men and women and boys and girls of faith. This is what Paul is saying. He says we're being built up in him. The work of going on, being strong and strong as men and women of faith is a constant work that's going on. That's why Paul guides them in the scriptures right now. That's why in other places we're told to read our Bible. We're told to study. We're told to come, confess our sins, and make sure <clears throat> we find ourselves doing everything we can to the glory of God. We, he says we are established in the faith. In other words, you and I have been planted, not in some man-made religion, but in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, all that he has done. We have not chosen a religion among religions to say, well, I think I have this one. Sad to say, some people have done that and is living that kind of Christianity. <clears throat> but true Christianity is not that way. Paul is saying, all that God has done, he has done it to you. And what he has done to you, you should be expressing, truly expressing forward a life of gratitude and thankfulness to God himself. Not just going along and saying that, you know, I show up at church every now and then. I do this. I read this Bible every now and then. No, but I am now doing what needs to be done. In the midst of this chapter, the second chapter, verses 8 down to 19, Paul then gives something, that there's some warnings that they need to understand. Paul lets them know that Christ's death and what it all stood for and what it is. But he says in 18, 8 to 19, see that no one takes you captive to philosophy. He's here in this point, he said, point, he said, there's a lot of false religions out there. I've heard how people have tried many. Well, you know what? I tried Buddha. I tried, tried this one. I tried this one, so and so. Now I guess I'll try Christianity. That ain't the way we get it there, people. That ain't the way. God is the one 
who draws us to himself. Just as Paul has said, God knew us before he said, let there be light. He had chosen us for himself. And Paul makes that clear in the book of Romans. So you and I, as we are now, when we come to life, remember, God had to also superintend all the people he would bring together so that you and I would come to birth. Your birth as a child of God is not a mistake. He brought you into the world because he knew you and had you at his own before he said, let there be light. Many believe that one religion is just as good as the next. But that's the lost men and women of the world. That's following the way of Cain. Live to ourselves. Put up, build our own altars, have our own God. Do whatever we want to do. But that won't find Christ. And Christ said, seeking him will be done as he begins to open our hearts and show us who we are. Are. He says, we no longer live by the principles of the world, by religious acts, decrees, do not handle, do not touch. You know in the passage here, don't have this kind of religion say, I got to do these things in order to be right with God. Some people change Christianity to that also. I got to do these things. And while I'm doing these things, God's going to accept me. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not it. And he says, be careful. Those teachings of men. Men have all kinds of ways that they come and try to teach and how you should be and how you should live. He says here, basically, the appearance of wisdom. That's all they are. Nothing is in it whatsoever. And that goes all the way down to the end of this very chapter. Nothing but appearance of male. Self-made religion, self-abasement, and severe treatment of the body. All these have no value against fleshly indulgences. Paul says all they are is man working up fanaticism to please some kind of God. And Paul said, those men around you right there in Colossae, and they're trying to pull you aside. And guess what, people? They still exist today. They're trying their best to show that Christianity is nothing. We got the right God. A few days past, week gone by, and it seemed like it's still going on. There's a, a mosque across the street on a corner and the cars get parked all the way up there. These guys coming out the outside if, it's, if the weather's night and you hear all of it, you know. And yesterday we were out there working on the front lawn and here come a car pull up and all these people walking down the street going and knocking on doorbells, Jehovah's Witnesses. They say they have God, the same God we have, but they don't believe in Jesus Christ. So what are they doing? Nothing but the appearance of wisdom. And they sit down and talk with you. They, they believe that they got all of it right. But what they've done, Jehovah's Witness, that if they have taken our Bible and they have distorted it and changed it so it will fit their whole program. Paul says, all these have no value against fleshly indulgences. In other words, Paul said the life of a Christian changes him or her in how he lives in this very life. But these religions, they do nothing with that. They don't change it at all. And how many people are walking around the world today calling themselves Christians, but they have no change in their lives. And they think because they do certain things, even if it's coming to church, and even if it's praying, even if it's giving tithes, they are righteous before God because of those acts. Paul is saying, no. God has to work in the heart. God has to be the one who does what needs to be done. And in chapter 3, Paul goes to a powerful section of the letter. He gives motivations and principles for the Christian life. He says, now after you see, you see all this, and I know what you're doing there in Colossae, but now 
here's things that you have to do for the Christian life. Put, put these things in your mind, in your head, and live with these things. And he begins, and notice it in verses 1 to 3, uh, 4 in, verse, in chapter 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, notice what he said. There's some people who are in the church and say, yeah, I know Christ. I will. He said, if you have been raised up with Christ, if something has taken place with you that is now known in the scriptures as a new life in Jesus Christ, he said, if, that's the, if you have, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says, set your mind on him. Because he died for us, and he goes on, and you died with him. Well, what do you mean by that, Paul? You died with him. Well, he's saying that all that Christ did when God sent him in the world, when he went to the cross, all those whom God gave to him before the world began, they were in Christ when he died. He died for them, not for himself. And every sin that they committed would put on that cross, and it was abolished. And now they have a new life in Christ. Oh, well, yeah, we have lived this life. We don't seem to be so new. But he's saying, in reality, that is what, what took place. He tells us that we have to see now who he is. Christ in all his glory is the one we look at. He tells us who we are now in Christ. Consider your earthly body as Dead to sin. It's kind of hard to do, isn't it? Consider your earthly body as dead to sin. Paul is saying here, before we got saved, the flesh is the thing that pushed us on. Our flesh and our desires and everything, which come from the inside, do this, do that, Go after this pleasure, go after that one. That's what he says, your earthly bodies. He says, consider them as dead. And then he, he even mentions what they are to immorality, passions, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. This body will not save God. It will not serve God. It will only serve its inward desires and, and yearnings. That's all the body wants to do. So Paul is making something here that we need to see. Consider, he said, this as dead. Now remember, that's coming after the fact that you've been raised up with Christ. You can consider this body as dead. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. All the things of sin that comes out of the body is why people will be brought to the judgment of God and cast into hell for all eternity. And he says, this is what we have to do. Consider the dead. Because we have died and our lives are hidden in Christ Jesus. When Christ returns, we'll be with him in glory. This is what Paul is teaching us. He tells us who we are now in Christ. Consider your earthly body dead to sin. Therefore, the power of sin is broken, it has been destroyed, and now you live with Christ. And he goes on in verses 8 and down to 11. And he used this wonderful statement here. He says, first of all, put off the old man. And it's something that you and I need to see and understand. And there's an act, a spiritual act that is taking place. Put off the old man. What is the old man? It is the body. The old man, the old woman, what we were, living by the control and all the desires of the body. Paul said, put off the old man. We once lived by the dictates of the body, but now we are free from its control. Sin has been defeated, therefore we must put them aside. Sins of speech, he goes on, sins of practice, sins of deeds, he said, put them all off. I ask you, if God's word is saying we can put them all off, 
Here's a question for you. You don't have to answer it loudly, but in your mind. Can you actually put them off? That's a question that you and I must answer. Can we actually do it? Is Paul telling us to do something which is some kind of pie in the sky? We can't even reach that? He's saying, this old man is dead. In other words, yes, you see me in a mortal body here. I see you in your bodies. But the body no longer has control over a Christian. We must see and understand that, dear people. Brethren shouldn't be bickering over sins that they have and uh, as if they can hardly get rid of them. The only reason we don't get rid of them is because we're not doing what Paul says here. Put them all aside. We once lived by the dictates of the body. Sins defeated us. We found ourselves no control over practices that we were doing. No control over our speech. And Paul handles all that right here and there. And Paul says, put on the new self. Ah, oh, there's an old BB, there's a new BB. There's an old LaSalle, there's a new LaSalle. You put your name in there. Is that the truth? Is there old and now a new? This is what he's saying. He says, this is the very thing you should do. Look at verse 3. You have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Renewing in which there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Paul now moves into the whole idea of the body effect, Christ itself. People, it's a shame that in some early Christian movements, in some movements today, they think that Christianity has something to do with a particular race of people. Paul said, no, those middle walls of petition have been torn down. We are one in Christ Jesus. There's no such thing as people now in the body of Christ, distinctions are gone, done away with. Christ have nothing to do with them no more. They've all been put aside. And he says in this, put on a heart of compassion. Now, Paul wouldn't tell us, or we can go drop back and say, God would not tell us this if it wasn't possible for us to do it. And he goes on, and I'll just run down what he's saying. The body life of the church is seen in how it gets along with one another, how it's attached to one another. This is what Paul is looking at here. Paul gives direction how we live a life of true grace with one another. Verse 12, put on. Verse 13, bearing and forgiving one another. Verse 14, put on love. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Verse 16, teaching and admonishing one another. Do everything in the name of Jesus and thank with thanksgiving. He's saying, this is what the church is. This is what we are up to this point. And Paul is saying, as he have worked and gone all the way up to this place, he comes to this point where he's saying, now, dear people of God, you ought to live that way. You ought to be those who are longing to be more and more like Christ. And you are knitted together, doing all you can to have the whole body more and more like Christ. You see, this whole idea is that we are a different people coming from different households. We come together and we're united in some kind of way. But we don't care nothing about each other when it comes away from the Sunday service. That's not it. The church is the united body. We are attached to one another, is what Paul is saying. And this is what we need to understand, dear people, what Paul takes us up to this point. There is a question that all of us must ask ourselves. Does this book, up to this point, describe me? Does this book, up to this point, describe me? me. 
Am I able to stand before God and say to him, I thank you, O oh Lord, because you have produced these graces in me. If it does, thank God, because you are not able to produce these graces within you without him. You are nothing without him. You have been made by him. And it points back to you've been his before the foundation of the world. And in time and space, he brought you to himself. And he is now the one who is over you right now, controlling you, growing you more and more in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are not, if you are true to yourself in God and say, I desire this kind of Christian life, but I still need growth. Bless God, because he will help by his power and the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to submit your life to him. So you know, we are all at different levels of growth, and you may not be all the way there, but if this is what you want, you see it, you know work has begun, do what Paul says here. Go over this book and read it again. Get to chapter 3 and read it. what Paul says from verse 1 down to verse 17. And look and see how Paul says, we are now those who are different. If the truths we just looked at do not grip your heart with a desire to live the life displayed in this book, you are either a Christian that is living your life for yourself instead of God? And you must pray that the Holy Spirit will work your heart, that you would be what you see here. Or you are unconverted and need to pray that God will have mercy on you and save you from your sins. Let us pray. Our oh, Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank thee for the truth in your word and how it comes to us, O oh Lord, and how it is, as it were, stepping stones to the glorious kingdom, line upon line, giving us more understanding and truth. We thank you we could see ourselves in what you have done in us. And Father, we pray now that you would guide us and help us. And may we pick up this book through this week and look at it. And may we use it as a mirror to look to ourselves and see if we see all that is said here by the apostle. But if truly your word to each and every one of us individually, help us to look at it, see ourselves, and live to your glory. Hear us, O oh Lord God, and bless us with your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.